like to welcome those that are now joining us in our live stream. Today we come to the end of our study of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. We have been on this journey for quite some time. And today we come at the end of it. Our scripture reading comes from the 16th chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. And as we read, as always, let us remember that this is the inspired word of God and inviting God to speak to our hearts, to give us understanding, to inspire us. And so here's what we find. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosi Potter, my relatives. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus send you their greetings. Now, to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray as we invite God to speak to our hearts. Lord, as we come before you, we acknowledge that we are dependent upon you. We know if this word is to come alive, you do that. We know that if we're to understand it, you give us the understanding. If our hearts are illuminated, you have illuminated them. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that we are utterly dependent upon you. I know I cannot teach this in the flesh, O oh Lord. I ask for that anointing power of your Holy Spirit. I ask for your cleansing through the blood of Jesus that I would be fit for your use. And, Lord, what we really desire today is to glorify you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. As we come to the conclusion of Paul's letter to the church at Rome, we are given a glimpse into what it must have looked like as he dictated this letter. He is surrounded by some of his closest friends and associates. And in many ways, this is a list of the heroes of the faith. We read in verse 21 and following, Timothy, my fellow worker, sends you his greetings. As do Lucius, Jason, Sosi Potter, my relatives. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus send you their greetings. You can just picture the closing scene of this letter. With all of them gathered in the home of Gaius, their gracious, welcoming, generous host. But it's not just for them. He is the host for the entire church at Corinth. And so in his home, Paul has gathered his inner circle, and they are listening as he dictates this great letter to his trusted scribe, Tertius. Tertius, what an interesting name. It means third. Now you have to wonder, who in the world would name their kid three? I mean, yeah, you know, I might have three kids. This is my third, but you didn't name them third. But what we learn about this man 
is that evidently Tertius was born as a slave. And many of the slaveholders wouldn't even bother with giving names to the children of their slaves. They were their property. And so they were numbered. And so it very well may be their names were Primus and Secundus and Tertius and Quartus. Which, by the way, tells us the same thing about Quartus, doesn't it? We got number three and number four. I kind of suspect these are a couple of brothers. We don't know that, but we do know that evidently they both were born as slaves. And we often associate slavery with manual labor and for good cause. But not all slaves were for manual labor. In fact, many of the slaves were educated. They did other tasks as well. And some of them, if they showed promise, were highly educated. And so we can be reasonably confident that Tertius was educated. He can read and he can write. And he is proficient in Greek. Maybe he had been a scribe as a slave. Yet, I don't think we realize the importance of that position. But I know this, if you have a letter you want to dictate, and if it's as long as this one, you're not going to be able to read a thing that I wrote. Because the longer I write, the worse it looks. And I mean, by the time you get to Romans chapter 1, verse 6, you're already in trouble. But not only that, in all honesty, I can't spell. I mean, if it were not for spell check. I mean, I'll type up a sermon and I'll look at it and say, oh, what is all this red? But you know, you just click and you fix it. But in the ancient world, you didn't have spell check. I mean, I know this guy is a lot smarter than I am. And we know he's proficient in Greek because we have this letter. And it is a masterpiece. I mean, when I'm writing things, you know, I am so thankful that I have grammar check. I write the sermon and it, I look at it and it's like, ooh, that really doesn't sound good, does it? And you've heard me make the same mistakes when I'm speaking. And so we know that Tertius must have been a very educated man. But we also know this. While he may have been a slave, he has been set free from the bondage of sin. And he is free in Christ. And we know that he and his disciples are, he and his brother are disciples of Jesus. They may be slaves, but they're children of God. They may be slaves, but they're playing a very important role in the kingdom of God. Paul had a lot of respect for this guy to choose him as his scribe. He trusted him to do that. This isn't just any letter. Now, joining Paul is Timothy, his dear son in the faith. Evidently, Paul had led Timothy to know the Lord, and he has been discipling this young man. And so now Timothy is his fellow worker. See, Paul first met Timothy on his first missionary journey. Well, I'm sorry, he met him on the second one when he went to Lystra. And it was there that Paul was so impressed with this young man that he invites Timothy to join Silas and him as they continue on their journey. And so Timothy is going to be with them as they go into Macedonia. That is northern Greece to us. And so Timothy is there when they go into Philippi. And when they leave Philippi, they go on into Thessalonica. And then they establish the church at Berea, and he's there with them. And then on into Corinth. And in fact, many of these churches, Paul would be sending Timothy back to them to minister there. And so Timothy became one of Paul's closest and most capable assistants. 
Paul also mentions three kinsmen. Now, you may remember a few weeks ago we looked at this. The NIV says they're relatives. And what we found is the word here can actually mean they may be blood relatives. In other words, these may be cousins or something. But that word kinsmen can also mean that they are fellow Israelites. Which, by the way, if you were an Israelite, you were family. You knew your family roots all went back to the same place. And so they may have been fellow Jews. Of these three, we first meet Lucius in Acts chapter 13. He was one of the prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch. And then we meet Jason in Thessalonica. In fact, Jason was Paul's host in that city. And Jason was someone who put his life on the line for Paul and the sake of the gospel. Because it was in Thessalonica that a mob got together and wanted to get rid of Paul. Now, they either wanted him to just leave or they were going to kill him. And when they're looking for them, they know Paul's been staying at Jason's home and so they go there to look for him. And when they fail to find him, they drag Jason out and take him to court. And they accuse him of causing trouble. And then they accused him of a capital offense. That he was defying Caesar's decree. Saying that there was another king. Jesus. And so Jason had to post the peace bond. That he wasn't going to cause any more trouble. We meet Susip Potter in Acts chapter 20. He was in the church at Berea. And he is now accompanying Paul to deliver the offering from the Macedonian churches to the church that is hurting and struggling in Jerusalem. And then finally we meet Erastus, an administrator in the city of Corinth. Now, the NIV says he was the director of public works. Some other translations will say that he was the treasurer, and I know. When we encounter that, we immediately begin asking, well, which one is correct? And the truth is, either one may be correct. Because the word that is used here simply means that he was an administrator in the city of Corinth. But I think we need to get a little bit of perspective on what that means. This is not like saying he's the mayor of Daleville. Now, I know we don't have one. This would be more like being the mayor of New York City. See, Corinth was a huge metropolis. And so what we know about this man, whatever he did, he was a high-ranking city official. But I think what we really need to discern from this list of names is it highlights the reality that we all need Jesus. Because what we have here is from the lowest rungs of the social ladder up to the higher rungs on that ladder. And whether we are a slave or someone who is a powerful person, we need Jesus. We all need him. And that's what this group of individuals realized. We're nothing without Christ. And we're all slaves to sin. And it's Jesus who sets us free and delivers us. Now, why would we consider these to be heroes of the faith? And it's because they were committed and faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, they knew Jesus as Lord. I mean, these are people who are deeply committed to Christ, whatever the cost might be. I've already mentioned Jason. We know the cost was great for him. And then Paul goes on to Berea, where we meet Susie Potter, and what we discover is that when Paul left Thessalonica, he went to Berea, which was a much smaller city. 
But the hounds of hell from Thessalonica are chasing Paul there. And so see, Potter sees that, that no matter where you go, there are always going to be those who are pursuing you if you are actually committed and faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have Timothy. I'm sure he was aware of this because it was in Lystra on Paul's first missionary journey that he was stoned and left for dead. And then he comes there a second time and he invites Timothy to join him. He knew what he was getting into before he ever started. I think as we look at the lives that some of these people lived and their commitment to Christ, it can be so troubling when we see Christians today who are just adopting the philosophy of the world around us. They are just caving in to the pressures of the cultural norms of our world. You see, following Christ has always had a cost to it. And some people just go along with the culture around us because they don't want any trouble in their life. But when you stand up for Christ, it is usually something much different than the prevailing court culture is doing. As we look at these men, we know that they weren't giving in to the desires to fulfill their own pleasures and lust. And yet we find so many people that say they're followers of Christ today, but they live this life as if it is all about them. Now, I know that's one of the challenges we face. Because initially, when you're telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is about them. Jesus came here for you. He died on the cross for you. He paid the ultimate price so that you could be forgiven of your sins and have the gift of eternal life and all the other benefits that we experience. But as we begin growing in Christ, we also understand it's not all about me. It's all about him. And so there were four things that this group of men understood about discipleship. They knew they were not their own. In fact, Paul is writing this letter from Corinth, and he would also write a letter to the church at Corinth, the first one that he wrote. And he said, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. See, that's the reality. When Jesus died on the cross, he bought me. I was a slave to sin. And if I choose to receive that gift, then I am to become a servant of Christ. That's what it means to know Jesus as your Lord. It's not just knowing him as your Savior. The Bible says we're to know him as our Savior and our Lord. Yeah, I believe the message that he died on the cross and shed his blood to pay the debt for my sin. He took the hit for me. But he's also my Lord. If someone's a Lord, that means they govern over my life. And so they knew they were not their own. They had been bought at a price. They also understood that life was a battle. Now, I think we all understand that. But when you come to know Jesus Christ, then there is a spiritual battle that is going on. And it is so intense that it is called spiritual warfare. In fact, we're even told to put on the whole armor of God. Why? Why would you put on an armor if you're not going into battle? You talk to any soldier, they're not going to just walk around wearing, wearing body armor unless they're in battle. And we're engaged in spiritual warfare. And it's even harder because we don't fight with the weapons of the world. Our weapon is the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Our weapon is the peace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our weapon is love. 
And so we have to trust that God has equipped us for that battle. And they knew that they were fighting and they would keep on fighting. They would not quit. They wouldn't give up. There was no surrender, even if it meant fighting to the death. Because they knew they were fighting the good fight. They also understood that while rest and leisure are necessary in order to be restored, they knew they were being restored for battle. They didn't see it as a lifestyle. And they understood that every believer was called into ministry. They understood that every believer has been gifted by the Holy Spirit. And that every believer does ministry through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the next thing I want to do here is just address the dilemma of verse 24. You may or may not have even been aware there was a dilemma here. But if you're reading from the NIV, or if you looked at the screen this morning, you wouldn't have even noticed that verse 24 wasn't there. If you're reading in the NIV, you go from verse 23 to verse 25. Some versions that you may be reading will actually have verse 24 in brackets. And so, you know, we just read that and we don't even stop to find out why. We also do this. If you're reading the NIV, there is a footnote at the end of verse 24 that takes you down to the bottom of the page and tells you what verse 25 said and why it's not there. And it's not there because most manuscripts do not contain it. Now, I know I've heard this before. Every now and then I'll see these little, well, for lack of, I just know how to call it like it is. I'll see these stupid little arguments on Facebook. Have you ever seen a stupid argument on Facebook? Yeah, if you get on it, you've seen them. And I've seen some where they post on there that you can't trust a lot of the modern versions of the Bible because they leave things out of the Word of God. And this will be one of the examples they mention that if you look, it doesn't even contain verse 25. I mean, evidently these are people who never look to see why there's a footnote there. If there is a footnote, there's usually there for a reason. It helps to illuminate you on something. Or if the brackets are there, they're there for a reason. And so most of the manuscripts did not contain this verse. Now, this is a theory. You take this part with a grain of salt. But this is the Perkins theory on verse 25. Back then, you didn't just print Bibles. You copied them word for word. Remember, you don't want me even doing that. Even if it's spelled right and I'm writing it, you still won't be able to read it. But they would copy it. Now, by the way, they do make mistakes with printed as well. Actually, my very first Bible had the book of Job in it twice. Yeah, my teacher couldn't believe it. We, I was in grade school and we were having sword drills. You ever have those? That means, yeah, your sword is the word of God. And so they would actually call out... Uh, Bible verses, and you would look them up to see who could find it the fastest with that. And she had one that was in Job, and when I told the teacher I didn't know which Job to look in, she looked at me. She couldn't believe that my Bible had two Jobs. She had to come and look. See, we do make mistakes. Now, here's my theory on this. I think the scribe who was writing this was looking at in a manuscript, maybe even the original one that Paul wrote, He's writing along. He's been writing all day long. He's getting tired. His vision's getting a little fuzzy. And he gets here and he's really anxious to finish because he knows he's at the end of the letter and it's time to go home to the wife and the kids. And he's kind of hungry and he knows dinner's going to get cold if he doesn't get there. And he loses his place. And he goes back and repeated what he said in verse 20. Because you see, if you're looking at your footnote, verse 20 says the same thing that verse 25 says. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And then he must realize, oops, I've messed up. You don't just throw away a manuscript. I mean, parchment was expensive. 
you do it right. And he thinks, no harm, no foul. And he just continues writing. Now, maybe that's not how it happened. But I want us now to go on to what's really important in this letter. And Paul tells us his very purpose for writing it in verse 25. Now, to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. See, the very reason for writing this letter was so that we might be established, so that we will stand firm in the faith. Now, being established does not mean the end of progress. In fact, we need to look at it like our logo. You remember our logo. We've got a tree there, and you've got the roots that are shown with it, and then you've got the branches, and that's what we're supposed to be doing as disciples. We're to be branching out. We're to be reaching out to others, but you also have those roots that are growing deeper. They're becoming established. I saw something amazing when we were in Olympic National Park in what, Washington. We were on one of the trails there. We were walking. We came along a ridge. I think they called it Hurricane Ridge, if I remember correctly, but it may not have been. But anyway, there were trees there that they were growing out of the side and then going up. I mean, out of the side of the hill. And there would be about five feet of roots that would be out of the dirt. Evidently, the just washed away. So, you know, the tree starts growing out of that, and it's going to go straight up. And so eventually, whatever it was growing sideways, land shifted or something, it started growing upward. And so it's growing sideways. Now, you know, when you stop and think about that, I mean, it was Archimedes that said, give me a lever and I'll move the world. And here you got this huge lever about 100 feet long with the roots going sideways. And you think, how does that tree stand there? And this place gets strong winds part of the time. And it's because it was rooted. I have no idea how deep those roots had gone. See, that's what he's talking about. We are to be established. We are to be growing those deep roots into Jesus Christ with that. And we're to be coming stronger. And if you noticed... When Paul says, I'm writing so that you may be established, he's, this whole letter has been about doctrine. Now, doctrine simply means teachings. It is the sound teachings of the church. And so this letter contains every major doctrine of the Christian church. I mean, if it's a doctrine worth really hanging on to, it is here. Not all of them are here, but every major doctrine is. I mean, if you really want to be established, you master the book of Romans. It's part of why we've spent so much time in it. We need to get this mastered in our life. And all these doctrines, and he begins with where we have to begin. And that is with the foundation that we're sinners. You know, if we don't know that we're sinners, why do we think we need a Savior? And if we don't think we need a Savior, we'll never come to Jesus. And so it all begins with us understanding that we have sinned. But not only does he tell us that we are sinners, we are sinners under condemnation. As the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. That means eternal separation from God. And so now that we understand the dilemma that we are in... He tells us that we have this hope of justification by faith in Jesus Christ. And that justification in simple terms simply means that God takes me a sinner and he makes me so pure and clean it's as if I never sinned. And when God does that and I am justified, he takes my sin and they are covered with the blood of Jesus. Never to be seen again. And I am clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And so when God looks at me, in spite of all of my sin, he sees me in the righteousness of Jesus as if I've never sinned. 
And so he takes sinners under condemnation. He pays our sin debt. And by faith, he makes it as if we never sinned. And after we come to know Jesus, he tells us then that we're to be sanctified. Now, in simple terms, that means we're becoming more like Jesus. That's what we're supposed to be doing. The more we grow, the more like Christ we become. And so we are in a process. We're not perfect, but we are to be moving in that direction. But we're not going to arrive here. At least I haven't seen anybody that has. I've known some who thought they did. But I'll tell you, other people could see things they didn't see. By the way, that happens with all of us, doesn't it? The things people see that we don't see about ourselves. But after sanctification, he tells us that we will be glorified. John writes about it and he says, It has not yet been revealed what we will be, but we will be like him. Now, I know when we think about glorification, we often think about this body being glorified. I mean, we know that this body will be raised and glorified. And boy, I'm kind of looking forward to that. It means it doesn't get old, it doesn't get weak, it doesn't groan or creak, that everything works like it was supposed to. I mean, it's like being a brand new you. Only sin's not going to be involved to mess up the brand new you. <laughs> no more pain. Sounds good to me. I'm all in. But it's more than that. When we will be like him, it means that we will eventually be like Jesus. Not that we're God, but that we are perfect in him. We have finally been glorified, not just our body, but us. Our thinking is glorified, every part of us. And so he says, this is what's awaiting us. This is how we are established. But he says, in order to be established, there is one resource that we count on. In fact, only one. Verse 25 again and following, he says, now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. We are established by God himself. The sole source of our stability and strength as disciples of Jesus is God. We don't do it ourselves. I know sometimes we try to do it that way and we ought to eventually figure out, I can't do this myself. The only way is because he establishes us. But it doesn't mean that God does not give us responsibility. Because we do have some responsibility. And what we have to be doing is getting into the word of God. That's how we become established. God establishes us, but it's taking those roots and taking them deeper into the word of God and that fertile soil of his word. It's where we're reading and studying the word of God. I'm sure I've shared this with you. You know what I'm going to say. It's still true. The single greatest catalyst for spiritual growth is the word of God. I know that experientially. We have to be in the word. And then we are to give ourselves over to him completely. It's not trying to do it ourselves. It is where we learn to totally rely on him. Depending upon him. And the Bible is replete with examples 
of God establishing individuals. And their stories are there for our benefit. Let me mention a couple. Let's take Abraham. He's called the father of faith. I mean, in the Old Testament, Abraham's probably one of the most important, especially if you're Jewish, because he's the father of the Jewish nation. And I mean, that's a big deal. And I think many times when we read about Abraham, the father of faith, and that Abraham believed God and it was credited him as righteousness, we get this idea that Abraham just had it all together. And because Abraham just had it all together and he had this tremendous faith, God called Abraham. And if you believe that, you're wrong. He didn't have it together at all. In fact, when God called Abraham, he was an idolater. So was everybody else where he lived. The only difference with Abraham is he heard God and he believed God. Sort of where we started, wasn't it? If you know Jesus. Been living in sin, I hear his voice and I choose to follow. That's what Abraham did. And he did. He believed God. And God told him, Abraham, I'm, I'm going to show you a land that is going to be your own. And so Abraham says, well, where are we going? And God says, I'll show you. You just trust me. And that's the way God works in our lives. I mean, have you ever noticed that? Now, I kind of like the plan, you know. Where are we going? Okay, we're going here, 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 and here. And then we arrive. But God doesn't do it that way because he tells me anyway, that's beyond your pay grade. You just follow me. Because if I give you the whole map, you're not going to trust me and you're not going to get there anyway. And so you just follow me. And sometimes it's a step at a time. Sometimes you just stand there praying and asking which way is the next step. But you trust him and you believe him. Now, Abraham believed God, but that still didn't mean Abraham had it all together. Because Abraham was kind of fearful. He was always afraid somebody was going to kill him. I mean, it's kind of amazing. God didn't even have kids until he was 99 years old and went through his whole life thinking somebody going to kill him. And in fact, what Abraham, would, he lied. Oh, he lied a lot. He was afraid somebody was going to kill him so they could have his wife. Sarah was beautiful. I mean, first time that he did that, I mean, Abraham was probably about 70 years old and he was afraid somebody was going to kill him for his beautiful wife. I, I mean, she must have been hot in her 70s. That's all I can say. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm not going any further with that one. But I mean, he was. And in fact, he told people she was his sister on more than one occasion. See, Abraham wasn't some guy who had it all together. But Abraham believed God. And God took Abraham, an idolater, who was fearful and not afraid to lie, and brought him to a place of honor. He did the same thing with Moses. I mean, you have Moses, and Moses is a prince of Egypt. Oh, he was born as a Hebrew, but he wasn't raised as a Hebrew. He grew up in the palace of the Pharaoh. A prince of Egypt, he had everything the world had to offer. But he didn't know that he was a Hebrew. And so one day he sees a Hebrew that is being abused and he kills the abuser. Now, that meant that Moses was now a murderer. I mean, we often think that's pretty bad. He's killed a man. In fact, he goes out on the lamb for the next 40 years. I mean, the next time we meet him, he is hiding out in the desert on a mountain. And it's there that God calls Moses. And Moses didn't want to be called. Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. Why don't you send somebody else? I don't speak well. Send my brother. 
Send my sister away. He didn't actually say that. But I imagine if he'd have thought of it, he would have. And eventually, God says, I'm talking to you, Moses. And eventually, Moses follows God and uses him in an amazing way. At 80 years old, he finally begins following God, and he is a powerful leader for the next 40 years. See, that's what happens when God establishes us. Now, Paul also tells us here how God establishes, what it is that he uses. And it's by the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, everything centers on Jesus. In fact, if it doesn't center on Jesus, it's not the gospel. It's no gospel at all if it doesn't center on Christ. And it's through that gospel that God establishes us. It was Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I mean, Jesus is the central figure of the Bible. The Old Testament is all about the Messiah who is coming. The gospels say the Messiah is here. The rest of it tells us how to live as he's called us. And then finally it tells us he's coming back. The entire Bible, Old and New Testament, is all about Jesus. All of history is about Jesus. All of time is about Jesus. I mean, we even divide our calendar. Before Christ, Christ is born in the year of our Lord. See, everything is focusing on Jesus. He's central to everything. And he is central to us being established. And he says, God establishes us by the revelation of this hidden mystery. Boy, don't you love it when you read words like that? The revelation of the hidden mystery. In other words, a mystery is something that is hidden. A revelation is when it is revealed. By the way, that's what the name Revelation means when you're looking at the last book. The unveiling. It is revealed. It doesn't mean apocalypse. Sometimes we get all messed up. But he says God establishes by the revelation of this mystery that has been hidden for the ages. And Paul sums this mystery up for us in Colossians chapter 1. He says the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. Oh, we're on the end with this one. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. So what is the mystery? Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's it. You are a revelation of the mystery. What it means when Christ lives in you and how it changes and how it transforms you and brings the power of God into your life. You see, the moment you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, he moves into your life. Christ in you. If you know Jesus today, Christ is in you. And that is the power to establish you. And when Christ is in us, he enables us to do two things. The first one is contrary to everything we know in the flesh. And that's where he gives us the ability to deny our natural abilities and strengths. It's where we come to the realization, I cannot do this in the power of the flesh. Now, we usually learn that the hard way. It's through failure after failure. Have you ever failed as a follower of Christ? This is a test, by the way, to see if you're still lying. You're following Jesus, you have failed. And when we fail, it's because we're trying to do it in our own strength. And when we do that, we will fail. 
And so he gives us the ability to learn to rely upon him. And it's neat where we need to be learning to rely upon him completely, utterly, knowing I am dependent upon Christ. And he gives us the ability then to live our lives as Jesus himself were living it. And there's no way we can do that on our own. But we can when we have been established. You see, the mystery the secret of authentic Christianity is Christ in you. And I think when we learn that and learn to live on that basis, we will join Paul in the praise. Because he ends his letter saying, To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Because we know God has done it all. He not only purchases our salvation, he is everything we need for this life and beyond. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is through this word that you establish us. You make it to where we can stand firm in Christ and in Christ alone. And for that, Lord, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.